Welcome to Amberger Smackdown. I'm J. Christoph Amberger. Shell money consists of seashells or even shell fragments that nimble fingers ground into tiny beads or discs. The tribes of Alaska and California cherished a species of tusk shell found along the northwestern Pacific coast. Its highest denomination consisted of 25 shells strung together, about six feet long, and worth a fistful of dollars among brothers. Elsewhere, money made of cowrie shell was popular. In Bengal, 3,840 cowrie shells made up a rupee. From the perspective of cowrie shell monetarians, modern Americans are utterly irresponsible. Measured by the standards of a 19th century Maldives coconut bazaar, few U.S. households would be considered prudent, prosperous, let alone well off. Applying the standards that 19th century Western economists developed to ascertain the wealth of nations, Americans seem hardly any better off. It's not the lack of cowrie shells that sticks in their craw, but the personal savings rate. Raised index fingers jab at its statistical decline in the late 1990s, its tumble to a 70-year low in 2001, and its collapse into negative numbers in 2005. Americans live beyond their means, don't provide for their future, live paycheck to paycheck. It's something to feel good about in a way. Europe and Asia can rationalize they're still not inconsiderable lagging behind American standards of living and prosperity by pointing out that the average prudent European has a few hundred bucks squirreled away in a passport savings account. Maybe even a string of cowrie shells picked up on a three-week beach vaca vacation on the Maldives. But in June, Barron's published an article titled The Great American Savings Myth which calls into question the personal savings mantra my colleagues of the bearish persuasion have been hom homming about like Tibetan monks chanting over yak but butter candles. After all, U.S. household net worth, assets minus debt, has never been higher, growing rapidly even as the personal savings rate nosedived. How can you get richer without saving? Or could it be that the existing definition of personal savings will no longer do? Barron's is reviving a case I made in my book Hot Trading Secrets two years ago, that the household savings rate by now is an insufficient because incomplete indicator of financial health. The problems in the definition. The Bureau of Economic Analysis defines personal savings as whatever is left after consumption spending is subtracted from disposable personal, disposable personal income. And here's the rub. At the end of 2006, American household net worth clocked in at a record $55.6 trillion. Household net worth represented 584.1% of disposable income, the second highest multiple on record. Real net worth per household is now at $486,000, 31.7% higher than at the end of 1996. Of those $55.6 trillion in household net worth, only $6.7 trillion was parked in checking accounts, time deposits, and money market funds, the classic savings vehicles. But in the modern economy, most saving is money put at risk or invested with the hope of large returns and the potential of substantial losses. So even if the dramatic rise in net worth were based solely on asset bubbles waiting to burst, it would not alter the fact that saving did indeed occur. It only occurred elsewhere. Of course, large parts of this net worth is invested in assets whose valuations are at risk and may fluctuate, like real estate prices and stock portfolio valuations. But home equity, for example, rep represents only just one-fifth of total household net worth. A catastrophic crash of 30%, almost three times as severe as the 1974 freefall, would result in a total net worth decline of just 7%. Even after a hit of this magnitude, household net worth would still be 22.9% higher than in 1996. We may still be short on the wealth quotient inherent in cowrie shell money hoards, but I'd like to re-emphasize a recurrent theme here at TaipanFinancialNews.com. It usually pays to question the numbers that the nodding herd bases their analysis on. An insufficient set of data is a poor base to make financial decisions on. The congenital bears have paid, paid dearly for looking at numbers to support their paternalistic gut feelings by missing out on boom after boom after boom. Let's not make that mistake here at TFN. 
For TapanFinancialNews.com, I'm Jay Christopher Amberg.